welcome to the CEC report for the 22nd of April 2016. I'm Elisa Barwick and joining me today is CEC leader Craig Isherwood. Welcome Craig. Yeah, thanks Elisa. And on today's CEC report we have 9-11 cover-up blows up in Obama's face and glass steagall or helicopter money. So firstly, 9-11 cover blows up in Obama's face. Now in the last week or so, there have been numerous very high level calls for the missing 28 pages of the 9-11 Joint Congressional Inquiry Report to be released. And this is the final chapter of the report which is completely blacked out or redacted. Uh, which actually is extremely revealing about the role of Saudi Arabia in 9-11. Um, now, together with the recent exposure of the Panama Papers, what we're going to talk about today is the fact that both of these revelations um, actually hit the real instigator in both cases behind 9-11 and behind offshore tax havens, which is the City of London. All roads lead to London in this case. Um, so you have the tax havens, which we've talked about on the show before, uh, on the Panama Papers. Yeah, and I think it's very important to note uh, that John Macdonald, the shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, you know, the Labor Party in the UK, in the UK, has come out and basically said that the City of London is the tax haven centre for the world, mm. right? And, uh, and all, all of the major tax havens are based on British territory, all these offshore islands and so forth. Alyssa, historically, I think we have to situate why we talk about the British Empire, the British imperial system, for our viewers, because people say, oh, why do these guys keep hitting the British? Well, if you go back 100, 150 years, the most dominant naval power in the world and military power was the British Empire. And back then it was gunboats and it was redcoats. Now, this is the, uh, the empire that you know, fought against the United States right from the beginning, uh, you know, the support of the Confederacy and so forth. Well, in the late 50s, uh, it changed and it morphed from being redcoats and gunboats into being an informal financial empire mm. centred in the city of London and in Wall Street. Mm. And since then, the same forces, the same imperial forces, the same oligarchical forces, you know, these, you know, these, these monarchical, monarchical system, have run the world through the... Uh, elimination in many cases of credit through the banking system and so forth and then of course taken enormous mega profits from the speculative bubble that's running the world today which is in the process of disintegrating actually and hived them off and had to put them somewhere so what do they do is they go and they stick them into these very small nations with a very secretive banking system called tax havens and the British run this the city yeah. of London runs this and this is this is what's now been exposed in these Panama Papers mm. Uh, so you, this is one, just one aspect that is really causing, you know, even mm. the Prime Minister of uh, Great Britain, David Cameron's own father, was part and parcel of using, you know, these tax havens to cover up his funds. And of course, yeah. David Cameron's had to try and justify the fact that he, uh, that this has taken place. And the other aspect which we're going to talk about more is the um, element of how you create wars and manipulate the globe, which is something that the empire has been expert in, but they do it in a more subtle way these days than the old days that you described. Um, so we're going to have a look, a bit of a look at what's in the 28 pages because that's very revealing via the Saudis of the British role. Um, so the 28 pages came out of the Joint Congressional Inquiry, which was convened right after 9-11 and reported within just over a year of that. Um, it basically shows that Saudi intelligence officers financed and organised support for the San Diego-based hijackers. It shows that one of those officers received money from then Saudi ambassador Prince Bandar bin Sultan. And it shows that a front for the Saudi defence ministry provided pay and expenses to the hijackers. So it's pretty damning. And I think why we're seeing this coming up and uh, that, that there's numerous calls for this chapter to be released at the moment uh, is that obviously the globe's faced with this scourge called ISIS. Um, there's been a, you know, a real fight against this in Syria and particularly because Russia came out saying, look, there are major countries that are funding ISIS, G20 countries. 
Uh, so there's been um, increased emphasis on actually revealing the conduits by which groups like a ISIS have come about and there's been major exposés and that has led to a real heat to get out uh, this 9-11 hidden chapter. So I want to go through a bit of a timeline of what's occurred just in the last uh, week or two. It started actually on the 10th of April with a 60 minutes program on the Saudi role in 9-11 and they called for the release of the 28 pages in that 20 minute documentary. Uh, it was actually, they had a series of people that they interviewed which was a bipartisan array of national security figures including the two co-chairs of the original 9-11 a commission inquiry, Bob, Senator Bob Graham and Porter Goss. Now within um, you know, hours of that show screening, Nancy Pelosi, the minority leader of the Democrats in the House, called for the release of the 28 pages. Then you had New York Senator Kirsten Gellibrand who called on Obama to declassify it before he left to go to Saudi Arabia. Obama's in Saudi Arabia right now so this was also relevant to the timing of it. Uh, and she said that he should raise this with King Salman as the first order of business. Then you had the Republican Chair of the House Intelligence Committee, David, uh, sorry, Devin Nunes, who called for the release of the 28 pages. You had Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders calling for it. This came just prior to the New York primary elections. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Paul Ryan, has since called for the, its release. Uh, Terry Strada, who is one of the widows, her husband died during 9-11 and she leads an organisation to uh, reveal these pages. She's done three or four interviews on CNN just in the last three or four days. Three congressmen, led by Congressman Walter Jones, have sent an open letter to President Obama calling for declassification of the 28 pages before he left for Saudi Arabia. And there's been some excellent media coverage. The New York Times on 16 April had a front page story revealing the Saudis threatened to dump $750 billion in US Treasury if Obama allowed passage through the, the Congress of the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act, or JASTA, which is in both houses and it has very strong bipartisan support and it's retroactive so it would basically allow the Saudis to get back on the list of people hit with lawsuits for 9-11. Um, the New York Daily News tabloid had a major expose of the Saudi royal family headlined Royal Scum and which, there was a... Which we cover in our alert service this yep, week. Yep, we'll yeah. put it up. Uh, and the new, there was a New York Post article written by the Hoover Institution's Paul Sperry, which was very good. It was called How US Covered Up Saudi Role in 9-11. Uh, he demands that Prince Bandar be considered a terrorist suspect. And he, he goes through extensively the US government and how they acted to cover up um, well beyond just hiding these 28 pages, but to cover up the whole thing. He even spoke to FBI agents who said that at every attempt to find the truth, they were stymied. FBI headquarters continually called them off and they were telling him, look, every road led back to the Saudi embassy in Washington and the Saudi consulate in Los Angeles. So Craig, there's a lot of emphasis on the Saudis here, but what we uniquely say is that it, it actually is coming from the British. And that comes back to Al Yamama, doesn't it? Well, it does go back into the 80s with uh, Margaret Thatcher and the deal that she did with the Saudis on this arms for weapons deal, uh, arms for cash deal, whereby you know, Britain was supplying weapons for, in return, you know, tankers of oil mm. that were basically shipped and sold with them. That big, that money became part of a slush fund, which has actually funded terrorism. And this Al Yamama yeah. inquiries have been shut down very quickly when they. Um, you know, there's been in calls for a real, investi mm. real investigation of this in the UK, but they're always shut down because it goes to the heart of the dirty money uh, networks, which, which are the same dirty money networks yeah, involved in the tax, the tax havens. havens. But more importantly, the role of uh, spons actually sponsorship of terrorism goes to the heart mm. of the British. And Prince Charles took over um, after Margaret Thatcher. He actually became the lead negotiator with Prince Bandar, his close friend. Uh, in setting this all up and continuing it and you know we document you should actually call in for our new citizen which extensively documents exactly how this took place and how this slush fund was created and the funds went directly through into Al-Qaeda, ISIS and these other terrorist yeah, exactly. groups. Exactly but it, it, 
Prince Charles has a very, very close association with a number of these figures that you're talking about, and we go through in this particular new citizen from December, November, December 2014, with this particular photo, mm -hmm. it's caused a lot of astonishment because people, oh, that can't be real, that no. can't be real. Yeah, it's but it is real. But There's a real affinity between the mm. British royal family and the Saudi royal families because, in effect, they're the same system. They're an oligarchical family system and they don't really care about you know, the development of the mm. common good and so forth. Mm. They're only interested in maintaining their power and their wealth, but more importantly, their power. So, so we'll stop for a moment, but after the break, we'll keep talking about this and even yet another revelation that's just come out in the last day or so. You've been watching the CEC Report, the weekly TV show of the Citizens Electoral Council of Australia. What can people do to find out more, Robert? Well, they can get on our website, www.cecaust.com.au, or they can call our toll-free number, Lisa, to order a copy of this, the Australian Alert Service, which is our weekly publication where we write up all the material we use. That number is 1-800-636-432. Welcome back to the CEC Report. We're discussing 9-11 cover-up blows up in Obama's face. So we just talked quite a bit about, you know, numerous calls putting intense pressure on Obama and his government to release this missing 28 pages of the 9-11 Joint Congressional Inquiry. And um, following upon all of what we just mapped out, uh, there was another stunning revelation in the last day or two. And this... Um, Re relates to classified documents and they were actually released a while ago last year sometime but they've just been put up they've been discovered and put up on the internet by somebody who you know fed into this whole campaign uh, and they're documents uh, put together by the interagency security classification appeals panel and it includes 29 documents which reveal even deeper details of the Saudi royal family's involvement in 9-11 uh, and some of the most interesting documents are actually worksheets and interview notes of staff from the 9-11 Commission. And the 9-11 Commission was another, it followed the Joint Congressional Inquiry, so it was another investigation um, that went more into the details of who was behind all of this. Uh, and it show, the documents show evidence of direct involvement of the Saudi royal family, but also government ministries of Saudi Arabia, so the Ministry of Religious Affairs, the Ministry of Defence and Aviation, for example. And one of the documents, uh, which is most interesting, it's being referred to as Document 17, is a 47-page memo with names of Saudi government officials implicated in 9-11, uh, and by the way, the author of this document uh, at the time of the investigation was fired by the commission director for refusing to obey the orders to stop probing the Saudi role in this. Um, so it includes details of what the Saudis did. It's quite involved. Uh, there's a report, for example, of an envelope from the Saudi embassy in Washington that was found containing the flight certificate for an Al-Qaeda operative. This was one of the Al-Qaeda operatives that trained with the, um, uh, the terrorists that were involved in 9-11. He did the flight training and so forth. Um, it also extensively documents evidence of the FBI cover-up and there's quite detailed memos discussing the FBI's obstruction, its implications and what can be done about it. Um, so this is putting a lot of pressure on Obama. However, just before he left to Saudi Arabia, he reacted to all these demands by basically the White House announced that Obama will veto this JASTA, which is the Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act. So he's, you know, and he's gone to Saudi Arabia, he's been received by the king and so forth. There were talks about him being somewhat snubbed, um, but I think it's still as cosy as ever. They're probably, you know, trying to make sure that they're keeping Obama in line is all. But he's acting more like a king than a president. Yeah, really. but Craig, um, Senator Bob Graham, who co-chaired the original inquiry into 9-11, he said yesterday, your government, talking about the US, has purposely used deceit to with withhold the truth. The reason for deceit, to protect the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia from its complicity in the murder of 2,977 Americans. So this is a really big deal. What should Americans do about this? Well, Elisa, I think there, there's, more, there's small fractions of the American population that really want to see these 28 
pages declassified. I mean, he did promise, Obama did promise yeah. in the 2008 campaign he would do this, but then he's retracted, he's reneged, and he's, of course, gone back on this. This is an impeachable crime. He could, yeah, he high should, crimes and misdemeanours. He, he I mean. should have been impeached ages ago, but then you've got a problem within the Congress that they haven't pushed this through. They'd rather see Obama being there because they see him as being defeatable, or particularly the Republicans did, but there's been political games go on rather than really be concerned about the getting to the bottom uh, of the truth. But, I mean, what you're dealing with here is the British influence of covering up their complicity, which is what, you know, mm. the deep complicity of Prince Charles and the royal family. It's interesting that uh, Obama's going off to meet with the Queen and so Straight forth. Straight after the Saudi visit, yeah. Also to protect the international financial dirty money networks, mm. which is also intersecting in, the, in, in these uh, tax mm. havens and so forth. So there's a lot at stake here. Mm. In, in the context of the global financial system in the process of disintegration, where the transatlantic financial system can't survive, you have an alternative political formation right now called the BRICS, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, forming a coalition around the idea of sovereign nation states actually acting in the interests of their own people. They've got to get stronger on this idea of creating the credit necessary to fund their own internal development, although they're pretty good with the interna new international development banks and so forth that are coming out of the this structure, but the idea of creating one's own credit so you're not beholden to the Saudis. If the Saudis, if mm. I were in government and the Saudis says, well, you know, we're going to do this to you, yeah, so withdraw well, stick the it. cash. Yep, stick we'll create it. our own. Because the problem is it's just a bluff because there's many other things the US could do, you know, not, not violent things or anything, to the Saudis in order to make this proposition a very, uh, a very unlikely one mm. that they would go ahead with. But the point is that Obama's loyalties aren't, as we've seen, with the health care cuts, the Obamacare, the, you know, the push for war against Syria in the past, his interests aren't in the interests of preserving the true goals of America, which is what we've seen in the past from people like Franklin Roosevelt, who actually you know, brought America out of the Great Depression. He is more interested in creating war. He's more interested in being a king-like figure. He's acting like a king. What you mm. see with Obama is a king-like figure. Mm. And uh, the American people, I might just add, Elisa, are revolting against this. You've seen the campaigns of uh, Donald Trump. You know, this is a very frightening campaign with what this guy represents. But also, even more frightening is Hillary Clinton that referred to President Putin as Adolf Hitler. Now, if she becomes the President of the United States with those comments on the books, where does that leave Putin with the next United States President? Mm. This is a very dangerous, you know, situation where you've got, you know, and, and, you know, uh, Hillary Clinton is a real neocon. She's, she's a piece of work in terms of policy direction. I mean, she's going to push for, you know, the potential for more war, more of these sorts of um, mm. uh, really dangerous scenarios that we've seen under Obama. It's not going to stop under Hillary Clinton. No, no. And we do need that revolt of the people to actually force the real solutions. Yes. But after the break, we're going to talk more about what you mentioned about the real vulnerability of the imperial system at this time, apart from these scandals, their financial meltdown in progress. <laughs> Welcome back to the CEC report. Glass, Steagall or helicopter money? So this is an interesting one. <laughs> now, just to set the scene for it, there was um, a meeting of the World Bank and the IMF that took place in Washington, D.C. over the last week. And the reports that came uh, out of it, if you actually go to look at the working reports of the meetings and so forth, were all characterised by discussions of disappointing growth, risks, vulnerabilities and volatility. So, you know, essentially nothing has been solved since the GFC. And the other thing that happened in the last week is that America's banking regulator was forced to name a number of banks that have failed their living will tests. Um, and one of the main offenders was JP Morgan Chase. And it was named as a threat to the entire US financial system, the Federal Deposit uh, Insurance Corporation wrote a 19 page letter to JP Morgan Chase uh, and they said in the letter that JP Morgan's position could pose serious adverse effects to the financial stability of the United States. So this is a pretty big deal because all the banks that failed the living wills which also included Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Bank of New York Mellon and another Boston bank, um, they were described as being all highly connected with interconnected with other banks in derivatives deals. Well, that's where the, that's where it's really dangerous, Lisa, because J.P. Morgan admits it has fifty-two trillion dollars national capital value of the derivatives holdings. Now, 
you know, the IMF comes out and conservatively says there's about 700 trillion in the world. We say there's closer to about two quadrillion. Now, when you start looking at, you know, two with 15 zeros behind it, which is a huge figure, how on earth is that ever going to get paid? And what you're finding is that the, uh, the exposure for JP Morgan, even at 52 trillion, is so huge. The interconnectedness of these derivatives. Look, these things, they're off the books. Mm. They're over the, what it's called over the counter. So they don't, they don't appear on the balance sheets whatsoever. No one knows where these things go. No one can tell you uh, how the interconnectedness mm, relates. How to unravel between, them. And, you know, they've tried to do this. The, the, um, the G20 has come up, tried to come up with establishing these things called central clearing parties, right, in order to be able to try and regulate them. But as I said last week, a majority of these things aren't in these these, these, these clearing houses because they can't be. Yeah, well, 63% of JP Morgan's derivatives are over the counter, so there's yeah. not really any ledger of them at all. So, I mean, here we've gone, we've gone from, you know, if you go back to, say, the, the late 80s, right, you've gone from very little of these derivatives, in fact, next to nothing, maybe some classic derivatives like futures and so, so forth that are associated with actual trade. Um, but now you've got this enormous speculative bubble that no one knows where it's going to end, mm, mm -hmm. that, that is going to collapse at some point. There's not, this is what happens with bubbles. So Now, helicopter money, though, because, um, of course... Well, that's why they've got to print money out of just literally run the printing presses or create the credit on the, on the computer ledgers and literally drop it into the system because mm. they, don't know, they don't know where this money is going to go, they, but they need to have it in the system to meet the debt liabilities of that two quad, quadrillion dollars of debt that's... Yeah. sitting on top of the economy. Um, because one of the recent experiments has been negative interest rates. That's been, happened across Europe. It's happened in Japan. And basically, it's being described as a complete failure. Japan's economy is contracting. Bank lending is falling across Europe and across Japan. So yeah, this helicopter money idea is kind of the next step. Well, it's nothing more than qualitative easing. Well, again, yeah, yeah. Right? And they've been pumping money into the US economy. That was stopped just recently. But the Europeans have gone hell for leather, still putting Euro, euros into their system. And the more money they pump in, the less the money is actually worth because there's, it's not actually going into real productive activities. No. I mean, the idea itself of actually creating credit to put to, into something is a good idea, but what you put it into is kind of the key. Well, they basically say the central banks will create the cash and put it into public and private bank accounts. And what we know from the research that we've done is that money doesn't find its way into the economy. It just simply gets manipulated around to pay off bank debts and different obligations yeah. that come up relating to the speculation. We are saying the same thing mm. here in Australia. We should have a national bank that creates this money. As soon as we say that, it's funny money. Yeah. But what they're talking about, uh, people's quantitative easing that Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonnell in the UK are talking about, is creating this credit which is being done by the banking system now, but instead of just throwing it into the private banking system, direct that credit into actual physical production and physical economic infrastructure. So at the end of the day, mm. you see a physical asset that boosts the capability of the output of the economy. It's not into speculation. It's a huge deal of, of, of when you do that. Mm. And the, our example for us, and we've got presentations on our website relating to this is what was done during the war where the amount of credit expended by the government was 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 20 to 25 times what it was before the war mm -hmm. and it was put directly into the physical economy in order to build up the Australian economy to fight the war and at the end of it we became one of the most wealthiest countries in the world because we massively expanded our physical economy, mm. our output. You build your nation and your capability for it this to is, grow and flourish. It's not rocket um, science. And Glass-Steagall is a stepping stone to this. It's seeing, we don't have time for the details, but it's going through a big upsurge in the United States, especially in the lead up to the New York primaries, interestingly, with a lot of coverage and state legislatures that are promoting um, resolutions to uh, fight for Glass-Steagall. But you can read more about it uh, in this week's Australian Alert Service. Call in for a free copy. That's all we've got time for this week. Thanks for joining me, Craig. Yeah, you're welcome, Elisa. And thanks for tuning in. Join us again next week for the CC Report. You've been watching the CEC Report, the weekly TV show of the Citizens Electoral Council of Australia. What can people do to find out more, Robert? Well, they can get on our website, 
www.cecaust.com.au or they can call our toll-free number, Lisa, to order a copy of this, the Australian Alert Service, which is our weekly publication where we write up all the material we use. That number is 1-800-636-432.